In this video, we move on to the family of sequential homogeneous learning methods known as boosting. There are quite a number of different boosting algorithms, but all share the same key idea that weak learners, for example, stumps or trees, are built one after another in serial, and that at each iteration, examples that were misclassified in previous iterations are given higher weight or greater importance for training subsequent learners. To see how this works, let's step through this toy example. In this case, different classes of example are indicated by pluses or minuses. So let's imagine in this instance that we have a choice of two features, x1 and x2, and we are training decision stumps or thresholds on these. Accordingly, we might imagine that for our first iteration, we learn the threshold indicated by this box. This allows us to separate all of the minor signs from some of the crosses, where we can see by doing this that while we get these two red crosses classified correctly, there are three more on the wrong side of the threshold that get left out. The way that boosting then works is that in the next iteration, those examples that got misclassified subsequently get upweighted in the loss estimation at the next iteration. We visualize this by making them bigger in the figure. So in the second stage, the base learner is told to work harder at getting these upweighted samples correct. So we might imagine that he would next learn a threshold indicated by this red box. This time, however, we see it's made a mistake on these three blue minus signs. Therefore, in the third and final round for this example, these minus class examples get upweighted and the red examples from the previous iteration remain partially upweighted. And so the third base learner is encouraged to train a threshold which separates these examples correctly. Accordingly, it learns a threshold on the second feature. In the end, therefore, the final prediction from the boosting algorithm is made by weighting predictions from each of the individual base learners, giving higher weight to the ones that were more accurate. In this way, boosting can learn precise non-linear classifiers which are shown to significantly improve the accuracy of the ensemble relative to individual base learners and, as we will see later, improve the performance of the model on marginal edge cases that would otherwise be noisy or difficult to classify. Today we will cover the Adderboost algorithm as this was the first variant of the method which was proposed in the late 90s. In doing so, we will look at what to use as weak learners we will also see how the algorithm weights the importance of examples at each iteration and how it combines predictions across base learners at the end to make a final prediction. There are, however, instantly many newer variants of the method which can give better performance. These tend to vary, for example, in choice of base learner. Some allow bootstrapping of the data examples and each tends to vary slightly on how the weightings are performed. Of these, there are two more recent and powerful methods which are known as gradient boosted trees and XG boost. This is short for extreme gradient boosting. Here, gradient boosting is available in scikit-learn. However, XG boost, which increases the efficiency and in some cases the performance, requires install of a separate library. So now let's look at the Adderboost algorithm in more detail. So the first thing to decide on is what to use as weak learners. Generally, implementations such as scikit-learn tend to use trees. However, in what follows, we will imagine decision stumps as these are easier to interpret. Secondly, let's look in more detail at the weighting process. So all examples are initialized with equal weight. Then, as we saw in the toy example, at each iteration, a base learner, be it tree or stump, is fit to the data and the errors are estimated for each example. Subsequently, then, examples that are misclassified are upweighted relatively, where in fact what actually happens is that the correctly predicted examples are downweighted. And then, at the next iteration, the estimation of the loss is weighted to take this into account. So here is pseudocode for the original Adderboost classifier algorithm which trains decision stumps or trees as weak learners. So as you can see, and as stated on the previous slide, all examples are initially given equal weight, 
equal to 1 over n, where n is the number of examples. Then, for each tree or stump, the algorithm first estimates p of t, which represents the normalized weights or probabilities for each example. These weights are passed to the weak learner for this iteration, telling it to minimize the cost relative to that probability distribution. So in other words, it will learn a weighted cost paying more attention to getting higher weighted examples correct. After that, an error is calculated as a weighted sum over all examples, where here f minus y, the predicted label and the true label, will be 0 if the examples have the same class, and it will be 1 if an example is misclassified. Therefore, there is zero contribution from correctly classified examples and the contribution to the error for incorrectly classified examples is larger for upweighted examples. Next, this error is turned into a beta value where error is not allowed to dip below 0.5 or 50% accuracy which makes sense because if a weak learner is performing worse than random chance then it needs to be aborted so in this case the tree or stump is reset and a different weak learner is fit and doing this then means that this beta is bound between 0 and 1 with smaller beta corresponding to smaller error beta is then used to reweight examples for the next round where Actually, the weight of misclassified examples will stay the same, since, again, if f minus y is 1 for incorrect predictions, this makes this exponent 0 and turns the whole beta term to 1. On the other hand, when an example is correctly classified, it gets downweighted, since f minus y becomes 0. And this means weights get multiplied by the beta, which we've already said is bound between 0 and 1. So the lower the error, the smaller the beta, and hence the more correctly classified examples in the round get downweighted for weak learners that perform particularly well. Note this then has the effect of indirectly upweighting misclassified examples in the next round because the probability distribution is estimated by normalizing over the sum of weights. Finally then, at the end, the prediction for each example is aggregated from predictions across all of the base learners trained as a weighted majority vote. Regression on the other hand starts similarly but diverges at the point where the error is calculated. So typically a range of choices is offered here for estimation of the loss including absolute error, mean squared error or exponential loss. An average loss is then calculated again across all training examples and used to estimate a beta parameter which as with classification the smaller the loss the more the weight is reduced. Finally the way in which prediction is aggregated for regression may look complicated but in essence what it equates to is a weighted median and that's all you need to know. But as a way of an explanation what specifically happens is that the predictions are ordered from negative loss to positive loss and then this equality is equated for different numbers of base learners, stopping at the point where it's no longer true. Since this is comparing loss summed in order, starting with predictions HT, which are most small relative to the true label, it essentially means that it stops in the middle, assigning a predicted label from the weighted median where the weighting here is controlled by the betas, which each reflect total error for each of the base learners. Then, an interesting additional point about boosting is the reasoning behind its strong performance with relation to reducing not just the bias, but also the variance. So the reason Shapir gives for this in his paper is that even when training performance has saturated, boosting models continue to improve performance in the margins by further and further optimizing the losses of each base learner. In other words, it seeks to make the margins between classes bigger and bigger, a bit like a support vector machine. 
and this has the effect of reducing overfitting and continuing to improve performance on the test set well after training performance has saturated. In Tuesday's tutorial, we won't be going through the process of trying to implement these algorithms from scratch, but we will implement them in scikit-learn for application on the gestational age prediction task from the neonatal brain imaging dataset. And as we do so, it will be relevant to pay mind to some of the arguments and attributes with um, the ones that I consider important highlighted in red. So note that if you want to optimise or set the parameters of the base learners, such as the decision trees, then you can do this by setting the base estimator with those arguments. So the default is a decision tree, but if you want to use a decision tree that without the default decision tree parameters, you can do that by passing a decision tree with non-default arguments as the base estimator. Another thing to highlight is that as with bagging and forest, boosting also returns a feature importance's attribute. These are the arguments for the AdBoost classifier. For regression, arguments are fairly similar. However, you also have a choice of which loss you use when updating your weights, with scikit-learn offering linear, square, or exponential. Finally, before I finish, I wanted to comment on approaches for parameter optimization for ensembles, as this is covered in the tutorial. So I believe Maria has introduced you the grid search CV algorithm, which allows parameter optimization through tuning with a cross-validation loop. To use it, you need to create a dictionary of possible parameters. So typically what you would do for a non-ensemble method is just specify the name of the argument as the key and then provide a list of parameters to tune on. However, for ensembles, if you want to optimise any of the parameters of the base learners, you have to specify these arguments prefixed with the base estimator keyword, noting the two underscores here, where this example from Stack Overflow shows nicely how it should be done. So in conclusion, the important difference between boosting and bagging or forests is that in boosting, weak learners are trained not in parallel, but one after another, where this process acts to reduce model bias by increasingly focusing on misclassified examples at each subsequent iteration. Noting in terms of implementation, misclassified examples are upweighted indirectly with the algorithm actually implementing reduction of the weights of correctly classified examples. This then results in misclassified examples receiving upweighted probabilities for estimation of the loss in the next round. The final prediction for each test and train variable is then estimated through weighted aggregation, giving higher weight to the weak learners in the ensemble which perform best. Collectively then, this works to reduce bias and variance, where bias is decreased by focusing on correcting misclassified examples at each iteration, and variance is decreased through maximising the margin, even once accuracy saturates on the training examples, Please complete the Keats quiz on this video before you go on. In the next video, I will provide a quick high-level summary of stacking models with sufficient information for you to use them should you want to.